Hey everyone, welcome to Feeding His Sheep. Today we're going to dive into Daniel chapter 10. Beginning here in chapter 10, the book of Daniel starts to turn the final corner and we're entering the straightaway. There's only one last vision to await this a prophet who had seen so much, but this vision is going to be the most remarkable one so far. Somewhere around two years has passed since Daniel's last vision. The things that he saw and things that he recorded comforted the people in his time, but it strengthens the faith of those who read it in our time. Personally, this whole study of Daniel has strengthened my faith, and I pray that it has for you. Before we begin, I would like to point out something that will help avoid some confusion along the way. Chapters 10, 11, and 12 are all one single vision and the experience that Daniel endured while he was receiving it. Chapter 10 today shows us that Daniel's prophecies must have been picked up on the enemy's radar because a lot of spiritual forces attempted to block God's messenger as he was sent to interpret this vision in greater detail for Daniel. If the devil wanted so badly for chapter 10, 11, and 12 to not reach us, it must be of the highest importance to heaven. So chapter Chapter 10 is going to be about the experience that Daniel went through, and we're going to get a sneak peek at the unseen war that goes on that is hidden from our sight. But the actual vision and the prophecy will be in chapters 11 and 12. So this is basically an introduction to the final vision. But this is still vital for us to dig into and to understand it, because this sets the foundation for the rest of the text of this book. So buckle up and hang on, we're going to get a front row seat to the final part of this magnificent book. In Daniel chapter 10, let's kick it off with the first three verses. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the message was true and one of great conflict, but he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. Here we are in the third year of Cyrus. That puts us at about 536 B.C. Now, if you'll remember in chapter one, Daniel said that he served in the king's court until the first year of Cyrus. But we are now in the third year. Daniel is in his mid to late 80s, so retirement's not really out of the question. But Daniel's not just sitting on a beach or golfing somewhere in his golden years. He's keeping in touch with what's going on with his people and within the nation. Daniel is always busy praying and interceding on behalf of the people of Israel. We find him here praying, fasting, and mourning. Now, he still ate food, but there are different types of fasting that's not just complete abstinence from all food and from all water. I think that any form of denying yourself has been lost on modern believers today. It can be withholding from a certain treat that you enjoy. It can take the form of refusing to pamper yourself for a couple days. Fasting can be done in many forms, and it's beneficial to remind your flesh that it's not your master anymore. And of course, the main purpose of this is to focus solely on the Lord during the time of fasting instead of your own wants and your own fleshly appetites. Now, what Daniel is mourning over, why, why is he pouring his heart out to the Lord? Cyrus has by this point issued a decree that anyone who wants to return to Jerusalem and help rebuild the temple is free to do so. Out of the entire population of men, women, and children of Israel, only 42,360 people have left what was Babylon and is now Persia to return home. Ezra adds more detail to those numbers. He says 42,360 people plus 7,337 servants 
plus 200 singers. You would think that after all this time in captivity, the people would be eager to go home. But many of those people who had seen Jerusalem before being exiled have died. A new generation has grown up knowing this foreign land and Babylon and Persia has home. And add to that, they're living in a place of comfort with a roof over their head. And if they were to lay head to Jerusalem, they're headed to a place that lies in ruins. And they're going to face opposition from enemy nations while they're trying to pick up the pieces of a country that they've never seen. I believe that this may be part of the reason that Daniel himself did not go. If he's in his mid to late 80s, that hard journey and those harsh conditions are no place for an old timer like him. Plus, he still has some influence in Persia, so he can benefit the people of Israel far better in his position in Persia. Now, no doubt, Daniel used his connections to monitor reports of how things were going, which was not good news. Work was slow. Opposition was fierce in Jerusalem, and the people were growing complacent. They focused on their own houses and were neglecting God's temple. I think Daniel's heart was hurt more over his countrymen deciding that life in Persia was preferable to going back to Jerusalem. There's a word that comes to mind when I think of this situation. It's institutionalized. I've seen and read where some people have spent so many years in the prison system and they feel more comfortable in custody than they do when they are released. When they are turned loose into a world that no longer looks familiar to them, they don't know what to do with their freedom. And a lot of them will actually commit a crime just to go back to prison, to the structured lifestyle that they had grown accustomed to. In the days of Moses, the Israelites often grumbled in the wilderness and longed to go back to Egypt where they had spent 400 years as slaves. I guess that mentality tends to set in after long periods of time. Also, besides the people not wanting to go back, Daniel may not have understood why the rebuilding of the temple was not going any faster. After all, he read the writings of Jeremiah that says the exile is supposed to end after 70 years, and that has now passed. But as we have seen with many of Daniel's visions, sometimes prophecies are a dual fulfillment. They have a near fulfillment and a farther future one. And the 70 years prophesied are are no different. That prophecy applies to the people and to the temple. The first wave of exiles, the people, were deported around 605 BC. The first wave to return to the land was in 536. Depending upon which month in each of those years, that could make close to 70 years that the people have been in exile. Also think of the fact that the temple was destroyed in 586 BC. It was finished and dedicated in 515, adding up to 70 years for the temple. So there's going to be a delay of about 16 years in the construction of the temple when the people had all but given up until God finally sent some of these prophets to stir them up and get them into action again. But this delay of 16 years was also factored in to the timing of the temple as well as being 70 years. So the people were exiled for 70 and the temple was in ruins for 70. Now, if Daniel didn't know this, that might have been part of the reason that he was in mourning and calling out to God in prayer. But the third reason is that he probably wanted further information and clarity about this last vision that he had just received. Verse 1, which speaks of Daniel in the third person, might have been added at some point or other for clarity, or it might have been simply a heading for the writing explaining the context. After verse 1, Daniel is using first person terms of speech again, so we know that it's him. But in verse 1, it says he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. His first time, when he interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he had to go to God for understanding for that one. As time went on, each additional vision was another variation of the same thing. The rise and fall of future kingdoms, the rise and fall 
of the Antichrist and his kingdom, and then the ushering in of Messiah's kingdom. Each vision had different pieces, but they were all part of the same puzzle. They made the same picture in the end. So Daniel likely understood the main storyline without any help this time around, but he's not content with just sitting back and not finding out more. And that's a great model for us to emulate today. We should never reach a point where we're content with our knowledge of God and his word. We should constantly strive to learn more with each day that we are blessed with. Continuing on in Daniel 10, let's go ahead and read verses 4 through 9. On the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Euphaz. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And the sound of his words was like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me. For my natural color had turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Verse 4 just told us when the end of his 21-day fast was, the 24th day of the first month. So this partial fast took him into a few days after the Passover. Verse 3 tells us that he ate no meat, so it appears that this fast of his superseded his desire to observe the Passover in any kind of sense. But in reality, the only place that was acceptable for sacrifice and Passover observance was in Jerusalem at the temple, and it's not completed yet. So Daniel observing the Passover may not have been an option for the last 70 years. Now we're entering into the portion of the chapter that can be confusing if you just blaze through it and read it full speed ahead. To make this simple, let me just say here and now that there is more than one person and more than one being that Daniel speaks to and hears from in this chapter. If you just speed through this, thinking it's all the same person, it's going to leave you confused about who it could have possibly been. So to make it easier for you, I've divided these groups of verses that we read, you know, in and at a time by individual speakers. Verses 4 through 9 that we just read are one person. 10 through 14 are another, and verses 15 and on will be yet another one. So who are we talking about here in verses 4 through 9? There are many scholars who offer their own opinions, and many commentaries might differ on this. But as I've said many times, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. So look at this description and the details that we were given. Verse 5 says, Dressed in linen, whose waist was girded like a belt of pure gold. Verse 6 says, His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. The sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Now, using the Bible itself as a commentary. Have we ever read anywhere else about someone who had a similar experience? As a matter of fact, there was. There was another faithful Jewish man who also was an exile himself and saw the same visions that Daniel did. His name was John. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, it says, And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In verse 9, Daniel was on the ground. His face was in the dirt. In Revelation 1.17, John said he fell like a dead man. Now look at verse 7, just one more time, Daniel 10.7. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell upon them, and they ran away to hide themselves. Has this ever happened in Scripture before? 
Right before the Apostle Paul was saved, he was on his way to arrest Christians on the Damascus Road when a bright light shone around him and Jesus made himself known to that young man known as Saul of Tarsus at the time. And those who were with him didn't see that part. In the book of Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 7, it says, The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. So point number one I want us to make is to check out our experiences with others in Scripture. People are always talking about these spiritual experiences that they have had, and some are likely true and some could even be exaggerated a bit. Ask yourself, has this ever happened before in Scripture? And then ask yourself the most important question. How does this experience benefit my discipleship with Christ? God's not going to give you a spiritual experience just for the thrill of it or to break up your boredom. If it is from God, it will have a purpose. I promise you that. Just like the appropriate use of spiritual gifts will always be used for a purpose. If God is glorified and if you grow closer to him, that's great. But if you like it because it makes you feel cool or it might make you feel more spiritual to your friends, I'd start to question that. Daniel has previously seen a vision of Jesus in heaven, but now he is right there in front of him. And it's just too much for Daniel. It was too much for John. Daniel suddenly grew very self-conscious as well. He says, my natural color turned into a deathly pallor and I retained no strength. In the King James version of it, he says, my comeliness was turned into corruption. When you stand next to someone that's superior in something, you look at them and you start to compare yourself to them. I I laughed at the faces of some of these Olympic competitors that had to perform right after Simone Biles. They knew that they couldn't even come close to this girl, and it showed in their faces when it was their turn to go next after her. I've heard so many people, you know, who are angry at God tell me, when I get there, I'm going to ask him why this happened, blah, blah, blah. No, you're not. If godly men like Daniel and John fell down frightened and speechless, why would you think that you would be any different? Even Isaiah, when Isaiah was shown a vision of the heavenly throne, he felt terribly inadequate. In Isaiah 6, 5, he said, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you stand in the presence of perfect holiness and the brightest light of purity, you're going to feel so exposed, and your sin will have no dark corners to run and hide in. Now, what exactly Jesus said to Daniel in verses 6 through 9, we don't know. Daniel was out like a light. But if this event was special enough that the Son of God made a pre-incarnate appearance, this was most definitely a very big deal. But I think this might have been too much for Daniel. Even a man of integrity like him is brought low when standing before his Maker. I hear of so many people that are new to the faith wishing that they can have an experience like this. I once fancied that thought as well, but then I remembered a line from a movie that was called A Few Good Men, and it's a famous line that says, you can't handle the truth. I know for a fact that I could not handle this vision any better than Daniel did. As the popular song says, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Good luck getting that song out of your head the rest of the day. Now, one day we will all have our face-to-face encounter with Jesus, and I pray that you have committed yourself unto him as Lord and Savior before that day comes. But until then, don't expect the profound experiences that Daniel had as a new believer. Daniel didn't have all of this happen until his 80s. After a long life 
marked by faithfulness and devotion. I've noticed that men and women who have walked faithfully with the Lord for longer periods of time also tend to see and hear things that most people don't. Their spirits are more sensitive and more attuned to listening for the Lord. They can read the same passage of scripture as someone else and find an entire sermon on that single verse. And they are better able to discern things than most people are. So be patient. Seek the Lord first. Those gifts will develop in time as you grow in the faith and as you walk with the Lord. Enoch might have been taken up to be with God, but the Bible says it took 300 years of him walking with the Lord before that happened. But back to Daniel. After this extreme sensory overload just tripped all of his breakers, we see a different being reaching out to Daniel. So now we'll get verses 10 through 14 and see what's going on now. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to days yet future." Now, we're not given a name here, but my best guess on the identity of the one who touched Daniel and spoke here would be Gabriel. After the vision of Jesus departed, it took a touch from Gabriel to stir Daniel, but he was still so weak. His hands and knees were, that was the best he could muster. Now, seeing an angel is not a much calmer experience, you know, I would assume. I've never seen one that I'm aware of, but just think of all the strain that all of this excitement has put on the heart of this tired old prophet. In verse 11, the angel commands Daniel to stand up straight and apparently has to give him the strength to do so, but it says that Daniel was still trembling. You know, oh, how I love this scene. It's proper and it's right to fall on your face and to show reverence for the Lord. But after a certain point, Daniel is told to stand up and let's discuss this work that needs to be done. We got stuff to do, Daniel. So Gabriel began by greeting Daniel with a reminder that God loves him. You know, oh, Daniel, man of high esteem. That's twice he's been told that. When Gabriel met with Mary in Nazareth, he gave their, gave her a very similar greeting in Luke one twenty eight. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. The Apostle John was referred to in the Gospel of John as the disciple that Jesus loved. But the funny part is, Gabriel didn't call John the disciple that Jesus loved. James didn't call him that. Peter most definitely didn't use that phrase. John called himself that. But in actuality, it is a true statement. You could add your name to that as well, since he died on the cross for you, because he loves you. Although I wouldn't suggest putting that on your business card, you know. Oh, my name is Rick, the person that Jesus loves. That that might sound a little bit too obnoxious. So Gabriel goes on to explain to Daniel, after reminding him that God loves him and Daniel has found favor in his eyes, Gabriel tells him the reason for the delay in the answer to his prayers during that entire three weeks that Daniel was fasting and mourning. In chapter 9, Gabriel said he was dispatched from heaven the very second Daniel began praying, and he was there at the speed of thought. But this time, there was opposition and an obstruction of this angelic message. He had said in verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. This shows us that we have switched persons now. We're no longer talking to Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, for Jesus couldn't have been delayed for a single second. Nothing can stop the creator and the Lord of the universe. So who is this obstructing prince of Persia? 
From the context, this is not a human prince, for no human can stand against a supernatural being, such as an angel, but it's an evil spirit, or a fallen angel, which is a demon. A demon was sent to this area by the devil to ensure that Satan's will was being carried out in the government. There's a picture of a similar case in Ezekiel 28. The text in Ezekiel 28 begins with the lament for the leader of Tyre, which was the human king king that was on the throne. Then it shifts to another lament addressed to the king of Tyre instead of the leader of Tyre. But that description goes on to describe Satan, who is the power behind the throne in that kingdom. Here, Gabriel said, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Every time we see Gabriel in scripture, he is working as a messenger of God, delivering news from the throne. Michael is described as the archangel angel. Singular. It's always singular, as in only one, the supreme warrior of the angels. And every time you see the word archangel, remember there's only one. Michael came to the rescue, and the 21-day standoff was over, likely in an instant. No other angel, even the fallen demons, is a match for him. And we see this in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. But Gabriel gives us no more details of this battle than was necessary. He starts getting down to business in verse 14. Now I've come to give you an understanding of what's going to happen in the latter days. Brothers and sisters, there is a war going on all around us that we cannot see. And I thank God that I cannot see it because we would be living in constant fear if we were fully aware of the supernatural events that are happening all around us. You know, we might think it's comforting to think that we have a guardian angel that's protecting us from things, but we don't really give thought to what it is that we're being protected from. I heard a preacher say one time, there can be an angelic fist fight going on and an all out brawl on the floor of the church and we are blissfully unaware of it as we just sing and smile like nothing unusual is going on. Gabriel offered no further details about this battle going on to Daniel because that's not Daniel's fight nor is it our fight to worry about. I've got enough to worry about in my normal daily routine without concerning myself with the war that's going on around me that I can't even see. I'm just thankful that God has got this. That way we can just put on the armor of God that's in Ephesians chapter 6 and focus on serving the Lord in a fuller capacity instead of constantly worrying about attacks or these battles. Let us continue on in chapter 10 and get verse verses 15 through 19. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then this one with a human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. He says, O man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Now as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength and said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. After he'd heard the words from Gabriel, Daniel was back on his face, on the ground, again, Now it looks as if another person has entered this conversation. In verse 16, Daniel says, Behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. So if I was to take a guess, I would say this is yet another angel, possibly one that was accompanying Gabriel. I come to that conclusion because this situation has happened in Scripture in another place also. Here, Daniel was unable to speak due to being overwhelmed, so the angel touched his lips and he could speak. Well, remember me mentioning Isaiah earlier, who felt ashamed because of his unclean speech? 
In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. I am so thankful to be born on this side of the cross. Believers today do not need to have your mouth singed with burning coal from a barbecue grill. You don't have to need to be touched by angels to be strengthened. We are strengthened by the power of the indwelling spirit of Christ. So finally, after gaining a little bit of stability and coming to terms with this heavenly board meeting that Daniel is now a part of, Daniel says, may the Lord speak. Daniel now has the strength to hear what's going to happen to Israel in the latter days. We we underestimate what it must be like to hear God audibly speak. So many times I hear people say, you know, that if God verbally spoke to us like he did to the early folks in the Bible, more people would believe. Well, you know, he did that in Genesis chapters 1 through 6. God even spoke with murderous Cain. And by the time Noah had built the ark, there was only one person found faithful. Yes, there were eight people that were on the ark, but we are told that only Noah was found faithful. Many people heard Jesus speak, and only a few people truly believed. During the millennial kingdom, he will be right there on the throne. And at the end of 1,000 years, there are going to be people who are going to rebel and refuse to believe, even with him right there. When the Israelites came out of Egypt and had seen all the great wonders and miracles of God on the way out of Egypt, the people who ate the wonder bread from heaven every day still could not stand to hear God speak audibly out of sheer fear. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, it says, All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning, flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. It took Daniel a lot of preparation to be able to hear this last revelation to, from God to this old prophet. I dare say that we should spend every single day that we are given getting prepared for the day when we will hear God say our names, when we are called to stand before him. I think I'm still going to need a lot of strengthening from the angels in that day. Let us continue on in chapter 10 and get verses 20 through 20. 21. Then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia, so I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. Daniel's about to receive the answer to his prayer, but the battle was not over for his heavenly messenger. Though it seems as if the angel is just going to rush off without telling Daniel, the answer is actually recorded in the next two chapters, so stick around and we'll get to those. The angel had to make it quick, though, for he and Michael had to return to the battlefield that history is unaware of. He says he must return to fight against the prince of Persia. This This invisible spiritual war is going to continue for well over 200 more years until the Persians were defeated by Alexander the Great in 331 BC. That is the side of the story that history that history recorded with Alexander the Great. But there was so much more that the human eye could not pick up on during that battle. And here we see just a sample of that. Now, there is no reason to think that the same warfare doesn't continue today. As the hourglass of heaven runs lower and lower on sand, Satan knows that he's running out of time. That old serpent has his minions scattered all over. They're busy influencing people, from common individuals to local and state officials, and even some world leaders. It seems depressing that there are fewer and fewer godly men holding leadership offices anymore. Just know that that means that it's almost time for us to be called home. The devil is busy staying 
staffing offices everywhere. So when that trumpet sounds and the church is gathered home to be with the Lord, the devil's not going to have to worry about filling a lot of empty, vacant positions for this short-term kingdom that he's going to bring about in chapters 11 and 12. I'm pretty confident that it will be business as usual and hardly any disruption in a lot of businesses because there weren't a lot of Christians there to begin with. Next time, we'll start to unpack this remarkable prophecy verse by verse. I thank you for joining me during this introduction. I know it doesn't get into the prophecy part yet, but it gives us the setting and it tells us who will be speaking to Daniel as we hear about these things to come. But it shows us a glimpse of the unseen battle that goes on around about us every day. And we need to give thanks to the Lord for his provision and for his protection and all that he does. As we continue on in chapters 11 and 12, all throughout chapter 11, we're going to lay out the prophecy verse by verse. And there is a lot of it that has already been fulfilled. And as we lay out the prophecy verse by verse, we'll also lay out the historical record and see exactly how precise God fulfilled each and every one of the things that he predicted. It's going to be amazing, and I just love seeing fulfilled prophecy. So I look forward to you joining me next time.